Please join me in our responsive call to worship. Call to push our boats out. We pray for smooth waters. Call to cast out our nets. We pray for a large catch. Call to follow. We follow in faith. Let us sing our opening hymn, Jesus Calls Us. God loves us and calls us each by name. Knowing we are forgiven and unconditionally loved, let us boldly confess our sin before God. Let us pray. God of abundance and opportunity, you challenge our preconceptions even when we think we know it all. You have new discoveries for us to make. Like fishermen, after a long, difficult night, we come after a couple weeks that have left some of us exhausted, some of us upset, some of us bewildered, some of us relieved, but all of us ready to hear your word today. As the world rocks below our feet, may we grasp the net with you to capture what is lasting your way of kingdom, grace, and love, the way that reveals life in all its fullness. Yet too often, we have been distracted by the world's desires, attracted by the baubles of cons consumerism, the lure of self-centered ways of living, the ease with which we forget our neighbors. Forgive us abundantly, for only by your grace can we relinquish our grasp on what holds us back. May we step forward with those first disciples to follow your call. Friends, hear the good news. God's mercy is poured out like a mighty river. Grace flows like a never-ending stream. Believe the good news and give thanks. In Jesus, In Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. forgiven. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Eternal God, through long generations, you prepared a way for the coming of your Son. By your Spirit, bring light to illumine our path, that we may welcome Christ to rule our thoughts and claim our love. Amen. Our first scripture reading uh, today is from Psalm 90. Listen to the word of God. Fill us full every morning with your faithful love so we can rejoice and celebrate our whole life long. Make us happy 
for the same amount of time that you afflicted us, for the same number of years that, you, that we saw only trouble. Let your acts be seen by your servants. Let your glory be seen by their children. Let the kindness of the Lord our God be over us. Make the work of our hands last. Make the work of our hands last. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Now it's time for our time with young disciples. Pastor Jim is going to share with us a story about some fishermen. One day Jesus was out teaching and the crowd grew so, so big and so crowded that he asked Simon if he could get into Simon's boat and go out onto the lake. And Simon did that. And then after Jesus had finished teaching the children and all the adults who were there, he turned to Simon and said, Simon, uh, take your nets and let them down and put them into the water. Well, Simon had been fishing all night and they had nothing. Their nets were empty. They were so empty that they had pulled up onto the shore and were cleaning them because there were no fish in them. And I can't help wondering if Simon didn't think, whoa, Jesus, excuse me, but I'm a professional fisherman. I do this for a living. And if we couldn't find anything after fishing all night, there are no fish to be fished. And maybe that's what he thought. But what he did was obey Jesus and he dropped the net down into the water. And what happened was this. He came up ugh, with so much fish that the nets were almost tearing. So much fish that they had to call his friends, James and John, to come over and help to bring in the fish. When Simon saw that large catch of fish, he began to be afraid. But Jesus told him, don't be afraid, Simon. Put down your nets and follow me. And so that's what Simon and James and John did. They left their nets, they left their family business, their fishing business, and they began to follow Jesus and go with him to share in his ministry and his teaching and his blessing. Sometimes following Jesus is scary because it calls us away from what we know and where we know. It asks us to do things that maybe we never have done before. But Jesus still says to us, follow me. And our work is to say yes. Friends, let's pray a repeat after me prayer. Loving God, Loving God we give you thanks give you that you still call us, you still call us to, follow you. to follow you. Even when it is scary, Lord, Even when it's scary, Lord send your spirit, send your spirit to, help us say yes. to help us say yes. Amen. Amen. Well, last week, Jesus came back to his hometown and preached in his home synagogue. Reading from the prophet Isaiah, Jesus told the congregation the prophet's vision that had been fulfilled that day in their presence. It was good news. Then he told them it wasn't just for them, but for others too, that they had no special claim to God's love. Jesus let them and us know his ministry is for anyone in need of justice, anyone in need. 
It would be for people who would surprise us, people who might seem unworthy. This news drove the congregation to anger and violence. But Jesus gave them the slip and went on his way to carry out his mission. Healing, teaching. Everywhere he went, people were amazed. All who were sick came looking for healing. People in need of good news came to hear his teaching. The crowds grew bigger. It became clear that Jesus couldn't do this work alone. Which brings us to this morning's story. It takes place along the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Old Testament Hebrew name for the Sea of Galilee. From Luke chapter 5, beginning in the first verse. I'm going to read this again in, in a couple pieces. One day, Jesus was standing beside Lake Gennesaret when the crowd pressed in around him to hear God's word. Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. Jesus boarded one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, then asked him to row out a little distance from the shore. Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he finished speaking to the crowds, he said to Simon, Row out farther into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. But because you say so, I'll drop the nets. Let me stop here for a moment and share a few thoughts. Jesus gets into the boat of Simon, who will later be called Peter. Now, Jesus and Simon actually know each other from before. I skipped over a brief story that's at the end of the fourth chapter. Jesus had, had come to the home of Simon and cured his mother-in-law, who had a fever. I like to think Simon was thanking Jesus by letting him use his boat to teach from. Now, of course, the question is, why does Jesus get into the boat? Well, it's been discovered that if a lake is still, the water can act like an amplifier of sound. By the way, Luke doesn't tell us what Jesus was teaching, but we can gather he was continuing to share the good news from the prophet Isaiah. Good news for the poor, the sick, the oppressed, the outcast. All were welcome in the kingdom of God. Now, after teaching, Jesus tells Peter to head out into the deep water. That meant going out probably a mile or so. Why did Simon listen to Jesus? After all, he must have been exhausted from working all night and catching nothing. Why did he then let down the nets? They would have had to have been pulled back in and washed and mended again, a very tedious task, a lot of work. Maybe he had been listening to Jesus' teaching and preaching and remembered what Jesus had done for him. Still, it appears he wasn't expecting much. Because you say so, Simon responds. Probably not much enthusiasm there. But once again, Jesus surprises, picking up the story from the sixth verse. So they dropped the nets, and their catch was so huge that their nets were splitting. They signaled for the partners in the other boat to come and help them. They filled both boats so full that they were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinner. Peter and those with him were overcome with amazement 
because of the number of fish they caught. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners, and they were amazed too. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought the boats to shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's a familiar story. The calling of the first apostles. It's in, it's in all four of the Gospels. Now, the problem with familiarity is that we think we know the whole story. And we think that all four of those stories from the Gospels are the same. But each Gospel tells the story a little differently. Because they each have something different to say about Jesus and about his disciples. For this story... Luke's version is quite a bit different from the other Gospels. You see, in Matthew, Mark, and John, Jesus basically says to the disciples, follow me. And they just get up and follow Jesus, leaving everything else behind. Why, they don't even say goodbye to their families. What are they looking for? Well, there's not much context to figure out the answers. Luke, though, gives us a much better story. Actually, actually, he is the premier storyteller of the four gospel writers. There was the healing of Simon's mother-in-law that kind of sets up the story. Then Jesus teaching the crowd and these fishermen about the kingdom of God. And finally, we have this miraculous catch of fish that practically swamps their boats. This act of God in Jesus is all about abundance and provision. Peter, James, and John have enough to eat and then some. It's a physical act of having one's needs met. More than their own needs, they also have enough to sell, enough to feed families with an eye toward the community's need. Now, if this is where the story would have ended, we would celebrate the receipt of daily bread, which is no small thing in that context, or frankly, in the present as well, with so many facing food insecurity today and a long winter. The image of enough food, of provision and plenty is really compelling. But that's not where the story ends. There is a call. You've heard the talk. You've seen the action. You've experienced the grace. Wouldn't you want to follow Jesus? Now, what I want us to remember is that these first disciples are ordinary folks. This isn't a story about the call of people with special gifts for ministry. In fact, Peter feels so inadequate to the task that he even cries out, leave me, Lord, for I am a sinner. By the way, sin here, as in most other places in the Bible, does not mean Simon is a terrible, horrible, no good person. There's no mention of forgiveness here. Simon is admitting his limitations, his doubts, his sense of inadequacy to the task, it's kind of the opposite of privilege that I talked about last week. Jesus' response to Simon's sense of unworthiness is to give him a new vocation, a new calling. Or maybe I should say, Peter is given a new way to use the gifts he already has in service to God's kingdom. This is Jesus' invitation to meaningful work to have purpose. Surveys have been done in the past asking if people get meaning and purpose from their work. Is their work making a difference in their lives and in the world? Is it fulfilling? By and large, the answer is no. It pays the bills, it puts food on the table, but meaningful? 
how would you answer that question? Do you find your work meaningful? Or if you are retired, do you now have the time and the means to do work that is meaningful to you? For youth group, I enjoy playing episodes of the TV series, Joan of Arcadia. It only ran two seasons back in 2003 to 2005, which is a shame because it really was a great show. The hero is a high school girl named Joan who lives in the fictional town of Arcadia, Maryland. Like Joan of Arc, this modern day Joan hears from God. Only God appears in the form of ordinary people she encounters in her life. One time God is the lunch lady in the cafeteria, another time the street cleaner, or an eight-year-old girl or an electrician or a mime. In one episode, God tells Joan she isn't living up to her potential, especially in her school studies. Now, Joan can choose to listen to God or not. Joan decides to follow and convinces the vice principal to let her take an AP chemistry class. By getting to know some of the people in the class, Joan begins to discover they aren't the losers that she and most of the school thinks they are. Through the friendships that she makes with her classmates, Joan's family finds a car with hand controls for her older brother who became a paraplegic from an accident. And information comes to Joan's father who is a police chief and information that helps him find an arsonist. Now, does everything end happily ever after? No, and that's one reason I like the show. Throughout the series, Joan never leaves behind her calling as a student, a daughter, a sister. But she begins to see how God can work through her to make things happen, to become a catalyst, to use an AP chemistry word that she learned, to have meaning and purpose. Jesus sees value in the fishermen, even though they don't see value in themselves. Jesus calls them as they are, imperfect, questioning, doubting, just as God calls each one of us as we are. And everyone has gifts to share in God's work. And it's not just volunteering at church, though of course we need volunteers. I can't do this alone, and our leadership, the elders and deacons and trustees of this congregation, can't do it alone either. But true discipleship is not about leaving your job to go to seminary. Jesus didn't call the disciples while they were in the synagogue praying and worshiping God. He called them while they were doing their work, fishing and mending nets. And they would continue this work, but in a new way. Luke tells us Simon, James, and John left everything to follow Jesus. But that's not entirely correct. This is not about leaving your worldly possessions behind and selling all you have to follow Jesus. It's about leaving behind the old worldly ways of thinking and acting leaving behind trust in wealth and power and things, leaving behind a philosophy of scarcity that believes if you get more, I get less, leaving behind a focus on me and my needs. When Jesus tells the three fishermen, from now on, you will be fishing for people, the word for fishing actually has a slightly different meaning. It's not the same word used in Luke's gospel as it is in the other three. Think about it. When you catch a fish, you kill it, you scale it, you gut it, you cook it, and you eat it. I don't think that's what we want to do with new members. Here, the Greek word means to catch alive. And isn't that what Jesus offers us, life and possibilities and purpose? 
And aren't we offering new life in Jesus Christ to others? But remember, Jesus doesn't walk up to Peter and say, have you been saved? Like some Christians I've met. He spends time with the three men at their occupations, out in the deep water. Remember, Jesus was a carpenter, not a fisherman. Only after he spent a little time with them does he have the right to ask them to take their skills and use them in a new way toward kingdom work. Jesus calls all kinds of people into ministry alongside of him. We, the whole church, are invited to continue Jesus' ministry, to be a catalyst for God's work in the world, to follow a new way, the kingdom way, based on unconditional love and compassion, radical inclusion, unlimited forgiveness, grace, peace, and love. It's a way we can accomplish only through God's power. Peter, James, and John spent the whole night fishing without success. Then Jesus gets involved, and look what they can accomplish. It's also a way that is life-giving. Over the past year, how many stories have we heard about ordinary people bringing joy or life to others? The UPS driver who brought smiles and connected with people on his route at a time when we were all missing connections with each other. Or the nurse who stayed with a patient as they died so they wouldn't die alone at the end. People finding new purpose in their work. Life-giving, loving purpose. This is what Jesus calls us to do in our jobs, in our communities, at our schools, with our families, and in our country. And that's what Jesus has been preaching about to the crowds everywhere he's gone and showing them through healing and miraculous catches of fish. And we know, and we will know, we are on the right path when we find, despite the risks, God's vision beginning to be reflected in our world. We will also discover we are spiritually nourished and find purpose and meaning for our lives. So when was the last time you stopped to consider God's calling in your life? For our prayer this morning, I actually have two prayers. I would like to pray both of them. The first, I'm borrowing from somewhere, is a prayer for the inauguration and beyond. Let us pray. Eternal God, grant us your guidance. Protect the president, vice president, and all the members of Congress. Empower us to serve the common good. Surround us with a vision that renounces violence and honors others' needs. We pray for our neighbors. Remember and heal the overlooked and injured. Comfort the families of those who died at the Capitol, patients who have succumbed to COVID-19 and lost ones, loved ones lost to racism. Comfort those who have lost friends, jobs, or hope. Grant us courage. Give us strength to work together as one nation. Prod us to surrender any privilege that whispers we are better than others. Inspire us at every step to use our best gifts to make our country a place of liberty and justice for all. Amen.
And now our prayer for intercession of intercession in Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord, unto paths we have never traveled, you call us. Toward horizons ever stretching, you call us. Through to dawns we have never known, you call us, and we hear. Take our journeys and shape them with heaven. Take our hopes and invest them with wonder. Take our longings and fulfill them in each moment, and we will go. Unto boats we have never seen, you call us. Into water we have never sailed, you call us. Through the nights we have never expected, you call us, and we hear. Take our living and hold us close. Take our needs and unfold them. Take our faith and trust what little there is, and we will go. Into a world we have broken, you call us. Into a life we have abused, you call us. Into a history we have never learned from, you call us. And we hear. Take our regrets and love them. Take our hurts and heal them. Take our questions and hold them. And we will go. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I uh, once again want to thank everyone for your continued support of the ministry and mission of this church with uh, the offerings that continue to come in, uh, many of them through the mail, but some people have actually stopped by and dropped them off in the office and they are appreciated and uh, being used to help continue this good work this congregation has done, been doing for years. And so I thank you for that and ask you to join in the prayer of dedication for those gifts. Eternal God, giver of all life, accept these offerings of our time and talent and treasures through which you have blessed us. May they be used to spread your good news around our community and into the wider world. Amen. Our last hymn is, I'm going to live so God can use me. Um, for those that are familiar, there's a little bit of an echo part in there that is fun to sing if you'd like to join. But uh... I'm going to live so.
friends, called to follow, called to care, called to serve. May we go from here ready to answer, called to act, called to listen, called to challenge. May we go from here ready to be sent. With God's blessing, with Christ's calling, with the Holy Spirit's leading, may we go from here in peace. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.